Ethos, Complete Happiness and Excellence, by Way of Virtue and Reason, by Alexander Campanella. Narrated by Alexander Campanella. This first edition audiobook is free for all, free to redistribute and remix, but not permitted for commercial use. For more content and to join the Ethos community, go to ethosananda.com and stalk us at Ethos Ananda on social media platforms. I dedicate this work to all of my teachers and masters. Introduction This text is not philosophy, but it is the truth. This text is not about God, but it can be used religiously. This text is not complete, but when you understand it and live it, you will experience completeness. Many people feel that ethics is a list of rules we need to follow to be good, and as we often aren't excited to read and follow a list of rules, we usually never study ethics. More importantly, most people don't have the desire to study ethics. If this text accomplishes just one thing, it will be to instill in humanity the desire to study and develop pure ethics, or ethos. Ethos is a Greek word that translates to character, and this is also the root word for ethikos, which is where we get the word ethics in English. As one would guess, this text essentially concerns ethical character. Aristotle's ethical system concerns character most of all, and character is completely under our control. This is great news. If ethics was just a collection of rules, one could violate the rules accidentally and still receive punishment. This happens quite often in our society. Minor violations like parking tickets and jaywalking come with fines and headaches for many of us. If we involuntarily or unconsciously violate these rules, are we still responsible? Many police officers and judges would say yes, because, quote, ignorance is not an excuse, unquote, and, quote, the law is the law, unquote. Of course, they are right. Fortunately, this text is not about a subject like law, which can be boring and tedious. This text concerns pure ethics, which encompasses all behavior for all people in all circumstances. One's behavior as a citizen of a city or state, as a family member, as an individual, as a student, as a member of a religion, and any other kind of human we may be. Still, it is not obvious why to study this further. Why should we develop our character? Why should we be good? Is there even such a thing as good or bad, or the good? These questions are gravely important, but the answer is much simpler than you might think. The key is happiness. When our behavior is good, and our good behaviors become good habits, our good habits become good character, and then finally we are happy and content. The primary reason to study and practice ethics is not to know or understand good and bad or right and wrong. It is simply happiness, not joy or bliss or some temporary feeling. It is the kind of fearless, invincible, stable and complete happiness that can endure millions of parking tickets with a big smile on its face. That person who has a perfect character can endure all challenges. That person is always happy. That person has many friends, and those friends are happy and good too. Even if that person falls to much misfortune, their good habits and character will take care of everything automatically. One of the first great thinkers to study ethics this way was Aristotle. Aristotle was the first person to write a self-help book called 
Nicomachean Ethics. The text you are reading now, Ethos, is a renewed look at Aristotle's system of ethics. Aristotle is still considered today by many to be the greatest philosopher or thinker in recorded history. So why not hear what he has to say on how to be happy? Most philosophers write texts to compete with other philosophers, using lots of jargon, and sometimes mostly to please their own big egos. This has left the rest of us in the dark. Even among the major religious or spiritual texts, we see the same trend, with few exceptions. These ancient texts, though indeed ultimate and supreme, are always out of reach for the common man. Of all the greatest and wisest thinkers in Western history, only Aristotle wrote two versions of his treatise on ethics. He wrote one for other philosophers and aristocrats, and one for the common people. My primary intention in writing the ethos is to finish what Aristotle started more than 2,000 years ago. Aristotle wrote the Nicomachean Ethics to be understood more easily by the common man, but even in the 21st century and beyond, many will find Aristotle too difficult, wordy, or esoteric to fully comprehend. The difficulty in writing this work is keeping the heart and soul of the ethics the same as it has been for thousands of years, while simultaneously designing it and portraying it in a way that the modern reader can understand and use in daily life. You will see quickly into the first chapter, ethics is all about practice. This is not, quote, classical philosophy, unquote. It is a how-to manual for the most important thoughts, behaviors, habits, and relationships you may experience in your life. The ethos does not go over every particular detail for every particular circumstance one can experience in life, but it does cover the underlying processes and meaning behind the life experiences most worth mentioning. Some verses are obvious, and you will read past them quickly. Some verses are short, but dense in meaning and require meditation and study to understand. After studying and living the ethos as long as I have, you will find that the ethos gives us solid metaphysical and moral ground to stand on. This vital foundation is under constant attack by the ever-expanding modern world. How you stand on that ground and what you build on it is up to you. For those who have lost their ground, I beg you to use the ethos to put the ground back under your feet. For those like Aristotle, born into good fortune and with high intelligence, I offer you a renewed and simplified take on this classical wisdom, as well as an easier way to share it with others and use it as a daily reference. How to read the ethos and how to use this audiobook. Some verses are best used in meditation, or what Aristotle might call pure study. By contemplating the verse in a variety of ways, according to your imagination, and feeling the intrinsic joy of the learning and self-development process, you can learn more about yourself and humanity while also gaining a better grasp on the ethos. Some verses are best used as mantras by slowly or quickly repeating the verse to yourself in your mind or out loud over and over again the meaning will reveal itself eventually, typically in a very sudden and powerful Eureka or Satori type experience. Some verses are tests of character. Did you understand it on the first read and catch yourself smiling or chuckling? That probably means you have already habituated that virtue into your character. Did you find a verse or chapter really difficult to understand on the first read and still difficult later on? That could indicate where your virtue lacks and where you need to focus in future study. It's also possible that when we don't understand something, the answer is right under our nose and we just need a different or fresh perspective to see what we've missed. In these cases, 
Asking others for help, especially strangers, can sometimes quickly correct our confusion. We can also use other verses from other chapters that may seem irrelevant at first to help us understand what we are studying. Much like in many religious and spiritual texts, each verse corresponds to each other verse, like a hologram or sacred geometry. If you think the verses are wrong, it is probably because you are lacking understanding. This text is not exhaustive of all possible human experiences, but it is effective in all important circumstances, short of purely spiritual or transcendental matters. How to use the ethos and the ethos audiobook. This kind of text and what it stands for is meant to be discussed and distributed as widely and deeply as possible. The ethos does not live in a vacuum, and it is not here just for our entertainment. It is here to be utilized and shared by all. Many of the problems we often think about concern other people close to us and society at large. In most social conflicts, a neutral third party is invaluable in attaining a final and stable resolution. The ethos can be used as a neutral mediator to resolve conflicts between individuals and groups. The ethos is most effective here because it is secular and based on logic and reason, and thus universal to all people in all cultures. Within a nation, we may use a constitution, and within a religion, we may use ancient scripture, but outside of these nations and religions, conflict never ceases. The ethos is one of the few tools we have that can cross all boundaries to resolve our most difficult conflicts. The epilogue will elaborate more on practical applications of this idea. For any problem you have, especially a difficult and meaningful one, you can apply it to the system outlined in the ethos. Ask yourself, is my problem about a thought, behavior, relationship, habit, or state of character? Then find the appropriate chapter and verses to diagnose your situation. As in medicine, once the diagnosis is attained and accurate, the remedy will often reveal itself quickly and naturally. Much like using any other kind of tool, if you don't like the result that came from using the tool, it's usually because you didn't properly use the tool. Some tools are faulty, but a tool built by someone like Aristotle will surely stand the test of time as it has. There are less than 400 verses here, so those in a hurry can read the ethos in just one day and listen to this audiobook in full in just a few hours. But those who are serious about seeking practical wisdom and eager for self-development will always enjoy reading, studying, and living the ethos. Chapter 1 an outline of human life and the role of ethos. Verse 1. There is a highest good. All other goods are subordinate to the highest good. Verse 2. Complete happiness is the highest of all the goods achievable in action and complete without qualification. Verse 3. What's best for society and individuals is better than just what's best for the individual. So, that highest good may be called political science. It determines what everyone in each class should study and do for the betterment of all people, individually and collectively. Verse 4. The end of political science is action, not knowledge. As with studying action of any kind, there is an exactness we cannot achieve because of the nature of this subject matter. Verse 5. There are roughly three most favored lives, the lives of gratification, of political activity, and of study. Verse 6. There are also roughly three objects of choice corresponding to the lives we choose, the fine, expedient, or pleasant. Their contraries are the three objects of avoidance, what is shameful, harmful, or painful. Verse 7. 
The primary function of the human being is activity of the soul in accord with and requiring reason. Verse 8. Of the non-rational part of the soul, the plant-like or nutritive part of the soul, shares in reason not at all. The animal-like part with appetites and desires shares in reason in a way, insofar as it listens to reason and obeys it. Verse 9. The part of the soul that has reason has itself two parts. One part will have reason fully by having it within itself. The other will have reason insofar as it listens to reason as a child obeys a parent. Verse 10. The function of the excellent human, then, must be the activity of the soul in accord with reason done excellently, and one would also find it pleasant in its own right. Verse 11. Complete happiness evidently also needs some external goods added, since we cannot or cannot easily do the finest actions if we lack the resources. Verse 12. Virtues of thought are subordinate to virtues of character, as action is required most of all for attaining the highest good, complete happiness. Verse 13. Happiness cannot be merely a state, for if it was, someone might have it and yet be asleep his whole life. Happiness consists in activities in accord with virtue. Happiness is an activity that is choice-worthy in itself, in its own right. Happiness lacks nothing. It is self-sufficient. Chapter 2. The Contents of the Ethos Summarized Verse 1. Virtue of thought arises and grows mostly from teaching. That is why it needs experience and time. Virtue of character results from habit. Verse 2. Habits are merely behaviors repeated across time. Behaviors are usually repeated by our pleasure and or lack of pain to do them, but can also be forced through strength of will, and behaviors are also impeded or promoted by circumstance. Verse 3. We acquire virtues just as we acquire crafts. What develops virtue also ruins it. For instance, abstaining from bodily pleasures makes us temperate, and once we have become temperate, we are most capable of abstaining from those pleasures. Verse 4. Virtue is a mean between extremes, much like diet and exercise. Virtue, and indeed almost all of our consciousness, is usually moderated by pleasures and pains. Verse 5. In the virtue of bravery, for instance, if one stands firm against terrifying situations and enjoys it, or at least does not find it painful, one is brave. If one finds it painful, one is cowardly. Verse 6. The primary role of education is getting children to have the right pains and pleasures, as we by nature find pleasure in base things and pain stops us from doing fine things. Verse 7. For a craftsman, he can judge the product by its qualities alone. But for virtues of character, we must judge by the way in which we act. Ideally, we must first know that we are doing virtuous actions. Second, we must decide on them voluntarily. And third, we must also do them from a firm and unchanging state. Verse 8. We must seek the intermediate relative to us and not in the object. For instance, if a doctor prescribes five pounds of protein-rich food, that could be less or more depending on the age, size, and fitness of the patient. Verse 9. What kind of condition is virtue? If it is just a feeling, then we can be good or bad people depending entirely on our mood. If it is a capacity to act, then we can choose to be good or bad on a daily basis. The remaining possibility is that virtue is a state, and more pertinently, a state of character. Verse 10. 
By states, I mean what we have when we are well or badly off in relation to feelings, behaviors, circumstances, etc. If, for instance, our feeling is too intense or slack, we are badly off in relation to anger. But if it is intermediate, we are well off. And the same is true in the other cases. Verse 11. If we are in a good state, performing our function well, we assume we have virtue. And it is also the case by necessity. Virtue causes its possessors to be in an excellent state. Verse 12. In general, there is no mean of excess or of deficiency, and no excess or deficiency of a mean. Vices like murder and adultery are simply bad. They do not have an intermediate condition. Likewise, a purely virtuous action, like saving innocent life from slaughter, is simply and purely good. Verse 13. The generous person appears wasteful in comparison to the ungenerous, and ungenerous in comparison to the wasteful person. So, between the excess, deficiency, and intermediate condition, we see friction and interdependence. Verse 14. The intermediate condition does not always lie precisely at the midpoint between two extremes. Rashness, for instance, seems to be closer and more similar to bravery and cowardice less similar. So we oppose cowardice more than rashness to bravery. Verse 15. We have more of a natural tendency towards pleasure, so we drift more easily to intemperance than to orderliness. Hence we say that an extreme is more contrary if we naturally develop more in that direction. So we must first of all steer clear of the more contrary extreme. Verse 16. We must also examine what we ourselves drift into easily, and we shall come to know our own tendencies from the pleasure or pain that arises in us. Verse 17. We are not blamed if we deviate a little in excess or deficiency from doing well, but only if we deviate a long way, since then, we are easily noticed. Chapter 3. On Pleasure. Verse 1. Enjoying and hating the right things seems to be most important for virtue of character. Pleasure and pain extend through the whole of our lives. Verse 2. Some say pleasure is base because the many lean toward pleasure and are slaves to pleasures. However, the practical aim of ethics does not justify pious frauds. Someone who insincerely says pleasure is base will not be able to avoid pursuing it himself on some occasions. Since he cannot live by the implications of his theory, the many will neither believe in his sincerity nor take his theory seriously. Verse 3. Plato argues the pleasant life is more choice-worthy when combined with prudence than it is without it. And if the mixed good is better, pleasure is not the good, since nothing can be added to the good to make it more choice-worthy. Nor clearly could anything else be the good if it is made more choice-worthy by the addition of anything that is good in itself. Verse 4. Pleasure seems sometimes to be a refilling, while pain seems to be an emptying, as with food. But this is not true with all pleasures, such as mathematics and sense perceptions, like smell, where the pleasure comes without any previous pain. Verse 5. Perhaps pleasures differ in species. Those from fine sources are different from those from shameful sources and we cannot have the just person's pleasure without being just, any more than we can have the musician's pleasure without being musicians, and so on. Verse 6. There are also many pleasures that we would choose if it did not bring any pleasure. For instance, seeing, remembering, knowing, and having the virtues. We would choose these even if no pleasure resulted from them. 
Verse 7. Pleasure seems to be an activity. Pleasure is complete, just as the act of seeing is. Seeing does not need anything else to complete its form by coming to be at a later time. And pleasure is also some sort of whole. Verse 8. The form of pleasure is not a process because it is complete at any moment. In building, the process is only complete when the building is finished. After laying the foundation, that initial part of the whole process is completed, but still more work needs to be done. But pleasure is present as a whole all at once, in an instant. Verse 9. Every perceptual capacity and sort of thought or study has its pleasure, and the most pleasant activity is the one that is most complete. The most complete is the activity of the subject in the most excellent condition in relation to the most excellent object of the capacity. Verse 10. Pleasure completes activity, not, however, as a state does, by being present within the activity, but as a sort of consequent end, like the climax in an epic drama. Pleasure is not continuous precisely because it acts as a consequent end of activity, not an intrinsic end. Verse 11. Nothing human is capable of continuous activity, and so no continuous pleasure arises either since pleasure is a consequence of the activity. Some things delight us when they are new to us, but later delight us less, for the same reason. The activity later becomes lax and careless, so the pleasure fades in correlation. Verse 12. Pleasure completes our activities, and hence completes life, the primary activity. So it is reasonable we also aim at pleasure, since it completes our lives. Verse 13. Each pleasure increases the activity, and what increases it is proper to it as well. Since activities are different in species, what is proper to increasing them is also different in species. Verse 14. Activities are often impeded by pleasures from others. Flute lovers, for example, cannot pay attention to a conversation if they catch the sound of someone playing the flute, because they enjoy playing the flute more than their present activity, and so the pleasure proper to flute playing destroys the activity of conversation. Verse 15. Proper pleasures increase the effectiveness and duration of activity, whereas an alien pleasure damages activity, and these alien pleasures do virtually what a proper pain does, though in a different way. For instance, if rational calculation has no pleasure and is painful for us, we do not continue to calculate since the activity is painful. Hence, the proper pleasures and pains have contrary effects on an activity. And the most proper pleasures are those that arise from the activity in itself, Verse 16. As activities differ, so do pleasures. Hence, the pleasure proper to an excellent activity is decent, and the one proper to a base activity is vicious. Likewise, appetites for fine things are praiseworthy, and appetites for shameful things are blameworthy. Verse 17. It is not surprising that the excellent person will find something objectionable that someone else finds pleasant. But these people are suffering from conditions like corruption and damage of the mind and character. So we should say that the pleasures commonly agreed to be shameful are not pleasures at all, except to corrupted people. Verse 18. The pleasure in an activity is more proper to it than the desire for it. The desire is distinguished from it in time and in nature, but the pleasure is closely connected to the activity. Sometimes the activity and pleasure are so similar we don't know whether the activity is the same as the pleasure. Pure study is one such example. Verse 19. Complete happiness is not found in amusement, though it sometimes seems that way. 
for it would be absurd if the ultimate end was amusement and our lifelong efforts and sufferings aimed at amusing ourselves. Serious work and toil aimed only at amusement appear stupid and excessively childish. Verse 20. We cannot toil continuously and thus require something like relaxation to refuel our body and spirit. Therefore, it seems correct to amuse or entertain ourselves as a form of relaxation so that we can be well prepared to do something serious. Verse 21. We can do fine actions even if we do not rule earth and sea. Even from moderate resources, we can do actions that accord with virtue. We can see many private citizens doing decent actions no less than people in power do. Even more, in fact. Hence the happiest person may well be neither rich nor powerful, and this sort of person may appear absurd to the many, for the many judge by externals, since these are what they perceive most. Section 2. Chapter 3. Pleasure and Complete Happiness. Verse 22. As activities become more serious and fine, they gather more praise. The activity that is better is superior, and thereby has more the character of complete happiness. Verse 23. We are more capable of continuous study than any other continuous action, and we of course want to be continuously happy. It is reasonable that those who have knowledge spend their lives more pleasantly than those who seek it. Verse 24. The self-sufficiency we are looking for in happiness will be found in study more than anything else. We do need other goods for a complete life, and even the just person will still need others as partners and recipients of his just actions. But the wise person is able to study even by himself. He can study with others also, but he is still more self-sufficient than any other kind of virtuous person. Verse 25. Among actions in accord with the virtues, those in politics and war are preeminently fine and great, but they require trouble and aim at some further end. But the activity of understanding and study is superior in excellence because it aims at no end apart from itself, has no external results beyond itself, and has its own proper pleasure which increases the activity. Verse 26. The features we ascribe to the blessed person also apply to the activity of study, such as self-sufficiency, leisure, unwearied activity, etc. So a human being's complete happiness will be this activity, if it receives a complete span of life, since nothing incomplete is proper to happiness. Such a life of constant and complete understanding would be superior to the human level and would be lived in so far as one has some inner divine element. Verse 27. Each person seems to be most fundamentally his understanding, if his understanding is his internal controlling and better element. For what is proper to each thing's nature is supremely best and most pleasant for it. And hence, for a human being, the life in accord with understanding will be supremely best, most pleasant, and completely happy. Verse 28. What about the virtue of gods? Anything that concerns actions appears trivial and unworthy of the gods. Nonetheless, if we suppose gods are alive and action is excluded, and production even more, what is left but study? So the human activity that is most akin to the God's activity will more than any others have the character of complete happiness we are looking for. Verse 29. Animals can feel pleasure but cannot achieve complete happiness as they are completely deprived of this activity of study. The gods seem to be fully blessed and the human life is blessed to the extent that it has something resembling this sort of activity. Hence, happiness extends just as far as study extends, and the more finely someone studies, the happier he is.
Verse 30. The person whose activity accords perfectly with understanding would seem to be in the best condition and most loved by the gods. Clearly, all this is true of the wise person more than anyone else, and it is likely that this same person will be happiest. So the wise person, more than anyone else, will be happy. Chapter 4. The Virtues The Self and Its Virtues of Character Section 1. Bravery Verse 1. The virtue of bravery is a practical and exemplary example to start our discussion on the virtues of the self that comprise the moral character of who and what we are. What sorts of frightening conditions concern the brave person? Surely the most frightening, for no one stands firmer against terrifying conditions. Verse 2. The brave person will stand firm against what frightens in the right way as reason prescribes, for the sake of the fine, since this is the end aimed at by virtue. Verse 3. The brave person must be moved by the fine, not by compulsion. This is evidently true for all the other virtues as well. Verse 4. The bravery caused by spirit and appetite would seem to be the most natural sort. Bravery is genuine and most excellent once it has also acquired voluntary decision, the goal of the mean and the way of the fine. Verse 5. Someone who is unafraid and unperturbed in emergencies seems braver than someone who is unafraid only when he is warned in advance, for his action proceeds more from his state of character and proceeds less from preparation. Verse 6. Bravery is about feelings of confidence and fear, but not about both in the same way. It is more about frightening things. Verse 7. The rash man who is excessively eager, is more likely to receive praise than the coward deficient in confidence. This holds true even in situations only mildly frightening. Section 2. Temperance. Verse 8. Temperance is a mean concerned with bodily pleasures and pains. It is concerned more with pleasures and less, in a different way, with pains. Verse 9. The pleasures that concern temperance and intemperance are those that are shared with the other animals and so appear slavish and bestial, such as sexual intercourse and gluttony. Verse 10. To enjoy these bodily pleasures shared with animals and to like them most of all is certainly bestial. Intemperance, then, is justifiably open to reproach. Verse 11. Someone is intemperate because he feels more pain than is right at failing to get pleasant things, and even this pain is produced by the pleasure he takes in them. Someone is temperate because he does not feel pain at the absence of what is pleasant, or at refraining from it. Verse 12. The temperate person has an intermediate state in relation to these bodily pleasures, for he finds no pleasure in what most pleases the intemperate person, but finds it most disagreeable. He finds no intense pleasure in any bodily pleasures, suffers no pain at their absence, and has no appetite for them, or only a moderate appetite, not to the wrong degree or at the wrong time, or anything else at all of that sort. Verse 13. If physical and emotional appetites are large and intense, they usually expel rational calculation. That is why appetites must be moderate and few, and never contrary to reason. Verse 14. The temperate person's appetitive part must agree with reason, for both his appetitive part and his reason aim at the fine. Verse 15. The temperate person's appetites are for the right things, in the right ways, at the right times, which is just what reason also prescribes. Section 3. Generosity. Verse 16. Both wastefulness and ungenerosity are excesses and deficiencies about wealth. Verse 17. 
The best user of riches will be the person who has the virtue concerned with wealth, and this is the generous person. Using wealth seems to consist in spending and giving, not taking and keeping. Verse 18. If someone gives to the wrong people, or does not aim at the fine, but gives for some other reason, he will not be called generous, but some other sort of person. Nor will he be called generous if he finds it painful to give. Verse 19. Nor will the virtuous person take wealth from the wrong sources. Since he does not honor wealth, this way of taking is not for him. Verse 20. It is also definitely proper to the generous person to exceed so much in giving that he leaves less for himself, since it is proper to a generous person not to look out for himself. Verse 21. Generosity of wealth implies giving in accord with one's means. Hence, one who gives less than another may still be more generous if he has less to give. Verse 22. It is not easy for a generous person to grow rich since he is ready to spend, not to take or keep, and honors wealth for the sake of giving, not for itself. Verse 23. The generous person is more grieved if he has failed to spend what was right to spend than if he has spent what was wrong to spend. Verse 24. Someone who is wasteful in this way seems to be much better than the ungenerous person because he benefits many, whereas the ungenerous person benefits no one, not even himself. Verse 25. The many are money lovers rather than givers. So it comes more naturally to human beings to be ungenerous than wasteful. Ungenerosity also seems incurable, since old age and every incapacity seem to make people ungenerous. Verse 26. It is plausibly said that ungenerosity is contrary to generosity, for it is a greater evil than wastefulness and error in this direction is more common than the error of wastefulness. Shameful lovers of gain, because they wish to acquire gains from the wrong sources, and all these methods of acquisition are also ungenerous. Section 4. Magnificence. Verse 27. A virtue similar to generosity may be called magnificence. Someone is called magnificent only if he spends the worthy amount on a large purpose, not on a trivial or ordinary purpose, for the magnificent person is generous, but generosity does not imply magnificence. Verse 28. The deficiency falling short of this state is called stinginess. The excess is called vulgarity, poor taste, and such things. These are excesses not because they spend an excessively great amount on the right things, but because they show off in the wrong circumstances and in the wrong way. Verse 29. The magnificent person will think more about the finest and most fitting way to spend than about the cost or about the cheapest way to do it. Verse 30. This magnificence is a sort of large scale of generosity in these things, and from an expense that is equal to a non-magnificent person's, he will make the result more magnificent. Verse 31. This sort of excellence is found in the sorts of expenses commonly called honorable, such as expenses for graduations, weddings, dedications, and for everything divine and in expenses that provoke a good competition for honor and the common good, such as the Olympic Games. Verse 32. A poor person cannot be magnificent. They lack the means for large and fitting expenditures. If they try to be magnificent, they are foolish. Verse 33. The vulgar person aims not at the fine, but at the display of his wealth and at the admiration he thinks he wins in this way. Where a large expense is right, he spends a little, and he spends a lot where a small expense is right. He is excessive in magnificence because his aim and attitude exceeds the fine, though his spending may sometimes be greater than that of the generous person. 
Verse 34. The stingy person will be deficient in everything. After spending the largest amounts, he will refuse a small amount and so destroy a fine result. Whatever he does, while he is doing it, he will hesitate and consider how he can spend the smallest possible amount. He will even moan about spending that and will always think he is doing something on a larger scale than is right. Verse 35. These states, vulgarity and stinginess, are vices, but they usually do not bring serious reproaches, since they do little or no harm to one's neighbors and are not too disgraceful or harmful to society at large. Section 5. Magnanimity. Verse 36. The highest and most difficult virtue may be called magnanimity. The magnanimous person seems to be the one who thinks himself worthy of great things and is indeed really worthy of them. Verse 37. Someone who thinks he is worthy of less than he is worthy of is pusillanimous. The one who seems most pusillanimous is the one who is worthy of great things, for consider how little he would think of himself if he were worthy of less. Verse 38. The magnanimous person is at the extreme insofar as he makes great claims, but insofar as he makes them rightly, he is intermediate. For what he thinks he is worthy of accords with his real worth, whereas the others are excessive or deficient. The magnificent person is similar in that he also spends an excessive amount compared to the average person, but it is done in a way that is virtuous and becomes beneficial to himself and many others. Verse 39. The vain person makes claims that are excessive for himself, but those same claims are not excessive for the truly magnanimous person. Verse 40. Honor is the greatest of external goods, so the magnanimous man wants honor most of all. Hence, the magnanimous person has the right concern with honors and dishonors. Even without argument, it appears that magnanimous people are concerned with honor, for the great think themselves worthy of honor most of all, but in accord with their worth. Verse 41. Since the magnanimous person is worthy of the greatest things, he is the best person. For in every case, the better person is worthy of something greater and the best person is worthy of the greatest things. Verse 42. Magnanimity, then, would seem to be a sort of adornment of the virtues, for it makes them greater, and it does not arise without them. Verse 43. He will still accept honors from excellent people, since they have nothing greater to award him. He will disdain dishonor, for it will not be justly attached to him. So when he is honored by just anyone or for something small, he will altogether disdain it, for that is not what he is worthy of. Verse 44. Hence the magnanimous person, given that he counts moderate honor for little, will also count other goods for little. For all the aforementioned reasons, he often seems arrogant to others. Verse 45. He is the sort of person who does good, but is ashamed when he receives it. For doing good is proper to the superior person, but receiving it is proper to the inferior. He returns more good than he has received. For in this way, the original giver will be repaid and will also have incurred a new debt to the magnanimous man, who will then be the beneficiary. Verse 46. When he meets people with good fortune or a reputation for worth, he displays his greatness, since superiority over them is difficult and impressive, and there is nothing ignoble in trying to be impressive with them. But when he meets ordinary people, he is moderate, since superiority over them is easy, and an attempt to be impressive among inferiors is as vulgar as a display of strength against the weak. Verse 47. Pusillanimity is more opposed than vanity to the intermediate condition because the pusillanimous person will refuse to attempt great deeds and thus many others 
lose the opportunity to receive great honors and goods. Section 6. Honorosity. Verse 48. The virtue concerning small honors does not seem to have a common name, but we can call it honorosity. Since people desire honor both more and less than is right, it is also possible to desire it in the right way. Verse 49. When we praise someone about honor, we refer to loving honor more than the many do. When we blame it, we refer to loving honor more than is right or less than the many do. Verse 50. In relation to love of honor, the mean appears as indifference to honor. In relation to indifference, it appears as love of honor. In relation to both, it appears in a way as both. The same would seem to be true of the other virtues, too. But in this particular case, the extreme people appear to be opposed only to each other because the intermediate person has no common name in language. Section 7. Mildness. Verse 51. Concerning anger, the intermediate condition is mildness. The mild person seems to incline more toward the deficiency because the mild person is ready to pardon, but not eager to exact a penalty. Verse 52. The excess condition might be called a kind of irascibility, for the relevant feeling is anger, though its sources are many and varied. Verse 53. For the deficient condition, the inirascible, they seem to be insensible and to feel no pain, and since they are not angered, they do not seem to be the sort to defend themselves. Such willingness to accept insults to oneself and to overlook insults to one's family and friends is slavish. Verse 54. Those responding in excess to anger could not all exist together closely, for evil destroys itself as well as other things, and if it is present as a whole, it becomes unbearable. Verse 55. Bitter people are hard to reconcile and stay angry for a long time, since they contain their angry spirit. It stops when they pay back the offense, for the exaction of the penalty produces pleasure in place of pain, and so puts a stop to the anger. But if this does not happen, they hold their grudge for no one else persuades them to get over it, since it is not obvious, and digesting anger in oneself takes time. This sort of person is most troublesome to himself and to his closest friends. Verse 56. We regard the excess as more opposed than the deficiency to mildness, for it is more widespread. It comes more naturally to human beings to exact a penalty on the offender than to overlook an offense. Moreover, irritable people are harder to live with. Section 8. Friendliness. Verse 57. Friendliness is a virtue concerning daily social life. Its mean lies between an excess, one who is ingratiating or a flatterer, and a deficiency, one who is quarrelsome. Verse 58. Among those who share pleasure socially, the person who aims to be pleasant with no ulterior purpose is ingratiating. The one who does it for some advantage in money or status is the flatterer. The one who objects to everything is the cantankerous and quarrelsome person. Verse 59. Friendliness differs from friendship in not requiring any special feeling or any fondness for the people we meet. For this person takes each thing in the right way because that is his character, not because he is a friend or an enemy. He will behave this way to new and old acquaintances, to familiar companions, and strangers, without distinction, except that he will always do what is suitable for each, for the proper ways to spare or to hurt the feelings of familiar companions are not the proper ways to treat strangers. Section 9. Truthfulness. Verse 60. Someone who is truthful both in what he says and in how he lives 
when nothing about justice is at stake, simply because that is his state of character, has the virtue of truthfulness. We do not mean someone who is truthful in agreements in matters of justice and injustice, since these concern a different virtue. Verse 61. The boaster seems to claim qualities that win reputation, though he either lacks them altogether or has less than he claims. The self-deprecator, by contrast, seems to disavow or to belittle his actual qualities. The intermediate person is straightforward and therefore truthful in what he says and does, acknowledging the qualities he has without exaggerating or belittling. Verse 62. Among those who boast with an ulterior purpose, the one who does it for reputation or honor is not blamed too much as a boaster. But the one who does it for money or for means to making money is certainly more disgraceful, as he appears to be doing an injustice. Verse 63. The self-deprecator is sometimes praised as being humble, whereas the boaster is nearly always reproached when caught. Therefore, it is the boaster rather than the self-deprecator who appears to be more opposite to the truthful person, since he is the worse of the two extremes. Verse 64. The truthful person inclines to tell less than the truth rather than more than the truth, since excesses are oppressive and this appears more suitable, especially in social situations. Section 10. Wittiness. Verse 65. Another virtue concerned specifically with social life may be called wit or wittiness. Those who go to excess in raising laughs seem to be vulgar buffoons. They stop at nothing to raise a laugh and care more about that than about saying what is seemly and avoiding pain to the victims of the joke. Those who would never say anything themselves to raise a laugh and even object when other people do it seem to be boorish and stiff. Verse 66. The civilized person's amusement differs from the slavish person's. This can also be seen from comedies as we age, for what young people find funny is often shameful physical abuse, but what older people find funny instead is satire and innuendo, which is considerably more seemly. Verse 67. The man with wit will discriminate in his remarks, for a joke is sometimes a type of abuse, and legislators prohibit some types of abuse, so they would presumably be right to prohibit some types of jokes too. Hence the cultivated and civilized person, as a sort of law to himself, will take this discriminating attitude. This then is the character of the intermediate person, whom we call witty, smart, or humorous. Chapter 5. Friendship. The Union of Self and Other in Virtue. Verse 1. Friendship seems most necessary for our life, for no one would choose to live without friends, even if he had all the other goods. Indeed, rich people and holders of powerful positions, even more than other people, seem to need friends. For how would one benefit from such prosperity if one had no opportunity for beneficence, which is most often displayed and most highly praised in relation to friends? For how would one benefit from such prosperity if one had no opportunity for beneficence, which is most often displayed and most highly praised in relation to friends? How would one guard and protect prosperity without friends, when prosperity is all the more precarious, the greater it is. Verse 2. In poverty and in the other misfortunes, people think friends are the only refuge. Moreover, the young need friends to keep them from error. The old need friends to care for them and support the actions that fail because of weakness. Those in their prime also need friends to do fine actions, for they are more capable of understanding and acting. Verse 3. Friendship would seem to hold cities together, and legislators would seem to be more concerned about it than about justice. For concord would seem to be similar to friendship, and legislation aims at concord among all, 
while also trying above all to expel civil conflict, which is enmity. Further, if people are friends, they have no need of justice. But if they are just, they need friendship in addition. Verse 4. Friendship is not only necessary, it is also fine. For we praise lovers of friends, and having many friends seems to be a fine thing. Moreover, people intuit that the same people are good and also friends. Verse 5. To a friend we must wish goods for his own sake. If you wish good things in this way, but the same wish is not returned by the other, you would be said to have only good will for the other. For friendship is said to be reciprocated goodwill, at the least. Verse 6. If we are to be friends then, we must have and be aware of our goodwill to each other and wish goods to each other from one of the three major causes of friendship, utility, pleasure, or character. Section 2. The Three Kinds of Friendship. Verse 7. Those who love for utility or pleasure are fond of a friend because of what is good or pleasant for themselves, not in so far as the beloved is who he is, but in so far as he is useful or pleasant. Hence these friendships and friends involved are coincidental, since the beloved is loved not in so far as he is who he is, but in so far as he provides some good or pleasure. Verse 8. These friendships of utility or pleasure are easily dissolved when the friends do not remain similar to what they were. For if someone is no longer pleasant or useful, the other stops loving him. What is useful does not remain the same, but is different at different times. Hence, when the cause of their being friends is removed, the friendship is dissolved too, on the assumption that the friendship aims at these useful or pleasant results. Verse 9. But complete friendship is the friendship of good people similar in virtue, for they wish goods in the same way to each other in so far as they are good, and they are good in their own right. Hence they wish goods to each other for each other's own sake. Verse 10. Complete friendship lasts as long as the friends are good, and virtue is enduring and stable. So we can assume a complete friendship based on virtue of character will last a long time. Verse 11. These kinds of friendships are likely to be rare, since such people are few. Further, they need time as well to grow accustomed to each other. They cannot accept each other or be friends until each appears lovable to the other and gains the other's confidence. Those who are quick to treat each other in friendly ways wish to be friends, but are not friends, unless they are also lovable and know this. For though the wish for friendship comes quickly, friendship does not. Verse 12. Friendship for pleasure bears some resemblance to this complete sort, since good people are also pleasant to each other, and friendship for utility also resembles it since good people are also useful to each other. Verse 13. It is possible for bad people as well as good to be friends to each other for pleasure or utility, for decent people to be friends to base people, and for someone with neither character to be a friend to someone with any character. Verse 14. It is clear that only good people can be friends to each other because of the other person himself, for bad people find no enjoyment in one another if they get no benefit. Verse 15. The friendship of good people is also the only one that is immune to slander, for it is not easy to trust anyone speaking against someone whom we ourselves have found reliable for a long time. And among good people there is trust, the belief that he would never do injustice, and all the other things expected in a true friendship. But in the other types of friendship, distrust may easily arise. Verse 16. Just as in the case of the virtues, some people are called good in their state of character, others good in their activity, and the same is true of friendship. For some people find enjoyment in each other by living together and provide each other with good things. 
Others, however, are separated by distance and so are not active in these ways, but are in the state that would result in the friendly activities, for distance does not dissolve the friendship without qualification, but only its activity. But if the absence is long, it can cause the friendship to be forgotten. Verse 17. Older people and sour people do not appear to be prone to friendship for there is little pleasure to be found in them, and no one can spend his days with what is painful or not pleasant, since nature appears to avoid above all what is painful and to aim at what is pleasant. Verse 18. Loving would seem to be a feeling, but friendship a state, for loving is directed no less toward inanimate things, but reciprocal loving requires decision, and decision comes from a state and good people wish good to the beloved for their own sake in accord with their state, not their feeling. Verse 19. When a good person becomes a friend, he becomes like a good for his friend. Each of them loves what is good for himself and repays in equal measure the wish and the pleasantness of his friend, for friendship is said to be equality. This is true above all in the friendship of good people. Verse 20. Of the other two types of friendship, the friendship for pleasure is more like real friendship, for they get the same thing from each other, and they find enjoyment in each other, or rather in the same things. This is what friendships are like among young people, for a generous attitude is found here more than among older people. It seems to be people of a mercenary or mercantile nature who prefer to form friendships for utility. Verse 21. Admittedly, as we have said, an excellent person is both pleasant and useful. He does not become a friend to a superior in power and position unless the superior is also superior in virtue. The excellent person will reach for proportionate equality in all friendships. So having a friendship with a person superior or inferior in position and power does not change the essential nature of friendship. Verse 22. A different species of friendship is the one that rests on superiority, of a father toward his son, for instance, and in general of an older person toward a younger, and of any sort of ruler toward the one he rules. These friendships also differ from each other. Verse 23. Each person does not get the same thing from the other and must not seek it. But whenever children accord to their parents what they must accord to those who gave them birth, and parents accord what they must do to their children, their friendship is enduring and decent. Verse 24. In all the friendships that rest on superiority, the loving must also be proportional. The better or more beneficial person must be loved more than they love. For when the loving accords with the comparative worth of the friends, Equality is achieved in a way, and this seems to be proper to friendship. Verse 25. If friends come to be separated by some wide gap in virtue, vice, wealth, or something else, they are friends no more, and do not even expect to be. It is most clear with kings and presidents, since far inferior people do not expect to be their friends, nor do worthless people expect to be friends to the best or wisest. Verse 26. Friendship seems to consist more in loving than in being loved. A sign of this is the enjoyment a mother finds in loving. For sometimes she gives her child away to be brought up and loves him as long as she knows about him. But she does not seek the child's love if she cannot both love and be loved. She would seem to be satisfied if she sees the child doing well, and she loves the child even if ignorance prevents him from returning to her what is due to a mother. Verse 27. It seems that loving is the virtue of friends. Friends whose love accords with the worth of their friends are enduring friends and have an enduring friendship. This above all is how unequals as well as equals can be friends since this is how they can be equalized. Verse 28. It is proper for good people to avoid error themselves and not to permit it in their friends, 
so they neither request nor provide assistance that requires base actions, but we might even say prevent this. Verse 29. What is unjust toward others becomes more unjust as it is practiced on closer friends. It is more shocking, for instance, to rob a companion of money than to rob a fellow citizen, to fail to help a brother than a stranger, and to strike one's father than anyone else. Verse 30. Accusations and reproaches arise most often in friendships for utility, and this is reasonable. Friends for virtue are eager to benefit each other, since this is proper to virtue and to friendship. Nor are there many accusations among friends for pleasure. For both of them get what they want at the same time if they enjoy spending their time together, and someone who accused his friend of not pleasing him would appear ridiculous, since he is free to spend his days without the friend's company. Verse 31. There are two ways of being just one unwritten, and one governed by rules of law. Similarly, one type of friendship of utility would seem to depend on character, and the other on rules. Accusations arise most readily if it is not the same sort of friendship when they dissolve it as it was when they formed it. Verse 32. Friendship for utility that depends on character is not on explicit conditions. Someone makes a present or whatever it is as to a friend, but expects to get back as much or more, since he assumes that it is not a free gift, but a loan in exchange. Verse 33. In friendships for utility, surely the benefit to the recipient must be the measure of the return, for he was the one who required it, and the benefactor supplies him on the assumption that he will get an equal return. Hence, the aid has been as great as the benefit received, and the recipient should return as much as he has gained, or still more, since that is finer. Verse 34. But in friendships in accord with virtue, there are no accusations. The decision of the benefactor would seem to be the measure. The controlling element in virtue and character lies in decision, and also, as we said, Virtuous people are more keen to give than receive. This does not suggest that fair exchange of benefits is unimportant in friendship based on virtue, but only that the basis for determining fair exchange is different. Verse 35. In friendships of different position, the superior person should get more honor, and the needy person more profit, since honor is the reward of virtue and beneficence while profit is a suitable and desirable award for the many. Verse 36. Someone who suffers a monetary loss by holding office receives honor in return, while someone who accepts gifts in office receives money but not honor, for distribution that accords with worth equalizes and preserves friendship, as we have said. Verse 37. Friendship seeks what is possible, not only what accords with worth, since it is impossible in some cases as it is with honor to gods and parents. For in justice, equality is equality primarily in worth and secondarily in quantity. However, in friendship, it is equality primarily in quantity and secondarily in worth. Verse 38. That is why it might seem that a son is not free to disown his father, but a father is free to disown his son. For a debtor should return what he owes, and since no matter what a son has done, he has not made a worthy return for what his father has done for him, he is always the debtor. But the creditor is free to remit the debt, and hence the father is free to remit. Section 3. Friendship and Political Systems Verse 39. To better understand the kinds of friendship and communities, we can look at the common kinds of political systems to draw correlation. There are three species of political systems and an equal number of deviations, which are a sort of corruption of them. The first political system is kingship, the second, aristocracy, and since the third rests on property, it appears proper to call it a timocratic system, though most people usually call it a polity. 
Verse 40. Resemblances to these political systems can be found in households, for the community of a father and his sons has the structure of kingship, since the father is concerned for his children much like a ruler. The community of man and woman appears aristocratic, for the man's rule in the area where it is right accords with the worth of each, and he commits to the woman what is fitting for her. If, however, the man controls everything, he changes it into an oligarchy, since his action does not accord with the worth or respect of each. Sometimes women rule because they are heiresses, and these cases of rule also do not accord with virtue, but result from wealth and power, as is also true in oligarchies. Verse 41. The community of brothers is like a democratic system, since they are equal except insofar as they differ in age. That is why, if they differ very much in age, the friendship is no longer brotherly. Democracy is found most of all in dwellings without a master, since everyone there is on equal terms, and also in those where the ruler is weak and everyone is free to do what he likes. Verse 42. Friendship appears in each of the political systems, to the extent that justice appears also. In the deviations, however, Justice is found only to a slight degree, and hence the same is true of friendship. There is least of it in the worst deviation, for in a tyranny there is little or no friendship. Verse 43. When ruler and ruled have nothing in common, they have no friendship, since they have no justice either. This is true for a craftsman in relation to his tool, and for the soul in relation to the body. For in all these cases, the user benefits what he uses, but there is neither friendship nor justice toward inanimate things. Nor is there any toward an animal of burden or toward a slave, in so far as he is a slave. For master and slave have little in common, since a slave is a tool with a soul, while a tool is a slave without a soul. Verse 44. Human beings form couples more naturally than they form cities, to the extent that the household is prior to the city and more necessary, and childbearing is shared widely among animals as well. For the other animals, the community goes only as far as childbearing. Human beings, however, share a household not only for childbearing, but also for the benefits in their life. The difference between them implies that their functions are divided with different ones for the man and the woman, hence each supplies the other's needs by contributing a special function to the common good. For this reason, their friendship seems to include both utility and pleasure. Chapter 6. Virtue of Thought Verse 1. There are three major capacities in the soul that control action and truth. Perception, understanding, and desire. Of these three, perception is clearly not the principle of any action, since beasts have perception, but no share in action. Verse 2. As assertion and denial are to thought, so pursuit and avoidance are to desire. Virtue of character is a state that uses decision, and decision is a deliberative desire. If then the decision is excellent, the reason must be true and the desire correct, so that what reason asserts is what desire pursues. This, then, is thought and truth concerned with action. Verse 3. The thought concerned with study, not with action or production, has its good or bad state in being true or false. For truth is the function of thought. But the function of thought concerning action is truth agreeing with correct desire. Verse 4. The principle of an action lies in decision, not the goal. The principle of decision is desire and goal-directed reason. That is why decision requires understanding and thought, and also a state of character. For acting well or badly requires both thought and character. Verse 5. Thought by itself moves nothing. What moves us is goal-directed thought concerned with action. Verse 6. 
The virtues of thought will be the states or conditions that best direct the rational part of the soul toward the truth. As the function of each of the understanding or rational parts is truth. Verse 7. There are five states in which the soul grasps the truth in its affirmation or denials. These are craft, scientific knowledge, prudence, wisdom, and understanding. Verse 8. Belief and supposition admit of being false, so are not states in which the soul grasps truth. Verse 9. Just as a heavy body moving around, unable to see, suffers a heavy fall because it has no sight, so it is with virtue of character and virtue of thought. A naturally well-endowed person without understanding can potentially harm himself. Verse 10. It is not merely the state in accord with the correct reason, but the state involving the correct reason, that is virtue. It is prudence, most of all the virtues of thought, that has the correct reason in this area. Verse 11. Not only does full virtue require prudence, but each virtue requires prudence, and that means each virtue is inseparable from all the other virtues. Section 2. Virtues of Scientific and Craft Knowledge. Verse 12. If we must speak exactly and not be guided by mere similarities, we are dealing with scientific knowledge. Verse 13. Every science seems to be teachable, and what is scientifically knowable is learnable. But all teaching is from what is already known, as we also say in the analytics, for some teaching is through induction, some by deduction, which both require previous knowledge. Induction leads to the principle or universal, whereas deduction proceeds from the universal. Verse 14. One has scientific knowledge whenever one has the appropriate sort of confidence and knows the principles. For if one does not know them better than the conclusion, one will have false reason concerned with production. Both are concerned with what admits of being otherwise. For if one does not know them better than the conclusion, one will have scientific knowledge only coincidentally. Verse 15. Building is a craft and is a certain state involving reason concerned with production. There is no craft that is not a state involving reason concerned with production and no such state that is not a craft. Hence, a craft is a state involving true reason concerned with production. Verse 16. Every craft is concerned with something coming to be, and the exercise of the craft is the study of how something that admits of being and not being comes to be. A craft is not concerned with things that are or come to be by necessity, nor with things that are by nature, since these have their principle in themselves and cannot be crafted. Verse 17. That which is crafted has its principle in the producer and not in the product. Verse 18. Lack of craft is the contrary state involving false reason and concern with production. Both are concerned with what admits of being otherwise. Section 3. Major virtues of thought, prudence, and wisdom. Verse 19. It seems proper to a prudent person to be able to deliberate finely about things that are good and beneficial for himself, not about some particular or scientific area, about what sorts of things promote health or strength, for instance, but about what sorts of things promote living well in general. Verse 20. Production has its end in something other than itself, but action does not, since its end is acting well itself. So prudence is a state concerned with the virtue of action about things that are good or bad for a human being in general. Verse 21. There is virtue or vice in the use of craft, but not in the use of prudence. For instance, in a craft, someone who makes errors voluntarily is more choiceworthy. But with prudence, as with the virtues of character, the reverse is true. Clearly, then, prudence is a virtue, and craft knowledge is not. 
Verse 22. Wisdom seems not to be exclusively about principles, for it is proper to the wise person to have a demonstration of some things. Indeed, the wise man has a propensity for explaining things in a way we can all easily and naturally understand. Verse 23. The wise person must not only know what is derived from the principles of a science, but also grasp the truth about the principles. A wise stonemaker, for example, means the best stonemaker in details as well as principles. Verse 24. Therefore, wisdom is understanding plus scientific knowledge. It is scientific knowledge of the most honorable things that has received understanding as its magnificent adornment. Verse 25. In contrast to prudence, wisdom is concerned with the highest realities. The wise man is not too interested in the particular circumstances of daily life. This is why we aim for both, prudence for practical matters at hand and wisdom for pure study. Verse 26. Some person can be wise but not prudent whenever he sees that he is ignorant of what benefits himself. What he knows may be extraordinary, amazing, difficult, and divine, but useless because it is not human goods that he looks for. Prudence, by contrast, is about human concerns, about things open to deliberation and concerning decision and action. Verse 27. To understand the difficulty and importance of experience in cultivating virtue of thought, we might consider why a child can become accomplished in mathematics but not in wisdom or natural science. Surely it is because mathematical objects are reached through abstraction, whereas in these other cases the principles are reached from experience. Section 4. Minor Virtues of Thought Deliberation, Comprehension, Understanding, and Cleverness Verse 28. We deliberate a long time, and it is said that we must act quickly on the result of our deliberation, but deliberate slowly. Further, quick thinking is different from good deliberation, and quick thinking is a kind of good guessing. Verse 29. Good deliberation is a sort of correctness in deliberation. However, the incontinent or base person may use rational calculation to deliberate correctly, but in action and reality will have got a great evil. Having deliberated well seems, on the contrary, the sort of correctness in deliberation that helps us reach a good. Verse 30. If deliberating well is proper to a prudent person, good deliberation will be the type of correctness that accords with what is expedient for promoting the end that prudence is always aiming for. Verse 31. Comprehension is neither having prudence nor acquiring it. However, the better we comprehend, the easier it will be to act on prudence. Comprehension says, if you apologize to him, he will be less resentful. Prudence says, since you must remove his resentment, you must apologize to him. Verse 32. Comprehension consists in the application of belief to judge someone or their remarks within the realm of prudence. The virtue of comprehension, then, is judging others and their speech accurately and finely. Verse 33. It is the correct comprehension and judgment of the decent person that means one has consideration. A sign of this is our saying that the decent person more than others is considerate, and that it is decent to be considerate about some things. Considerateness is the correct consideration that judges what is decent and true. Verse 34. It is reasonable that all these states tend in the same direction, for we often ascribe consideration, comprehension, prudence, and understanding to the same people. For all these capacities are about the last things, i.e. particulars. Verse 35. Correct perception of the particulars at hand is understanding. That is why understanding is both beginning and end. For demonstrations begin from these things and are about them. Verse 36. We see that wisdom produces happiness, not in the way that medical science produces health, but in the way that health produces health. 
For wisdom is a part of virtue as a whole. It makes us happy because it is a state that we possess and activate. However, we fulfill our primary function insofar as we have prudence and virtue of character. For virtue makes the goal correct, and prudence makes the things promoting the goal correct. Verse 37. There is a capacity called cleverness, which has ability to do the actions that tend to promote whatever goal is assumed and to attain them. If then the goal is fine, cleverness is praiseworthy. And if the goal is base, cleverness is unscrupulousness. That is why both prudent and unscrupulous people are called clever. Verse 38. Prudence is not cleverness though it requires this capacity. Prudence, this eye of the soul, requires virtue in order to reach its fully developed state. For inferences about actions have a principle and this best good is apparent only to the good person. For vice perverts us and produces false views about the principles of actions. Evidently then, we cannot be truly prudent without being good. Verse 39. As there are two sorts of conditions, cleverness and prudence, in the rational part of the soul, so also there are two in the part that has character, natural virtue and full virtue. Of these, full virtue cannot be acquired without prudence. Habituation is not complete until one has also acquired prudence. Chapter 7. The Field of Action and Knowledge Verse 1. In examining virtue and justice, we must define the voluntary and the involuntary, for our actions receive praise or blame if they are voluntary, but pardon, sometimes even pity, if they are involuntary. Verse 2. We should call actions voluntary or involuntary based on the occasion and circumstance, in order to include exceptional cases like hostage tyranny. Verse 3. An action is involuntary and forced without qualification whenever its cause is external and the agent contributes nothing. Verse 4. Actions done because of ignorance must be involuntary, but actions done in ignorance are not necessarily involuntary. Verse 5. Actions done because of ignorance of particulars, not universals, are involuntary. Verse 6. Voluntary action seems to be what has its principle in the agent himself, and knowing the particulars that constitute the action. Verse 7. Deliberation and rational wish are needed for someone to have a correct conception of what makes virtuous action fine and good in itself. Verse 8. What is decided is what has been previously deliberated. In other words, a decision without previous deliberation is not actually a decision. Verse 9. We deliberate about the actions that we ourselves can do. Deliberation about actions that are not in our ability may be better titled fantasy or some other name. Verse 10. Deliberation naturally occurs when the right way to act is undefined and the outcome is unclear. Verse 11. We deliberate on what promotes ends, not ends themselves. Rational wish concerns ends, and usually not on what promotes those ends. Verse 12. What we decide to do is whatever action, among those up to us, we deliberate about and consequently desire and choose to do. Verse 13. We wish for the end more than for the things that promote it but we decide on things that promote the end. Hence, the actions concerned with things that promote the end are in accord with decision and are voluntary. Verse 14. Our decisions to do good or bad actions, not our beliefs, form the characters we have. Verse 15. Each state of character has its own distinctive view of what is fine and pleasant. So the excellent person naturally sees what is true in each case, being himself a sort of standard and measure. Verse 16. In the many, however, 
pleasure would seem to cause deception, since it appears good when it is not. Certainly, they choose what is pleasant because they assume it is good, and avoid pain because they assume it is evil. Verse 17. Actions and states are not voluntary in the same way, for we are in control of actions from the beginning to the end, when we know the particulars. With states, however, we are in control of the beginning, but do not know, any more than with sickness, what the cumulative effect of particular actions will be. Nonetheless, since it was up to us to exercise a capacity in some particular way, states are also voluntary. Verse 18. There are two features that distinguish the virtuous person from someone who simply does virtuous actions. 1. The virtuous person responds flexibly to particular situations more accurately than someone who just has true beliefs about actions that are virtuous. 2. He does the right actions from the right state and motive. Chapter 8. Justice. The Completion of Virtue. Verse 1. The just is both the lawful and what is fair and the unjust is both the lawless and the unfair. Verse 2. Unfair injustice is a part of the whole of injustice, and similarly, fair justice is a part of the whole of justice. Further, whatever is unfair is typically lawless, but not everything lawless is unfair. Verse 3. In one way, what we call just is whatever produces and maintains happiness and its component parts for a political community. Verse 4. The person who has justice is able to exercise virtue in relation to another, not only in what concerns himself. For many are able to exercise virtue in their own concerns, but unable in what relates to another. Hence, justice is complete virtue, because it is the complete exercise of virtue. Verse 5. Justice, then, is the whole of virtue, not just a part. Likewise, the injustice contrary to it is the whole, not a part, of vice. Verse 6. The worst person, therefore, is the one who exercises his vice toward himself, his friends, as well as toward others. Verse 7. Suffering injustice is not up to the victim, but requires someone to commit the injustice. Clearly then, suffering injustice is not voluntary. Verse 8. Justice is the only virtue that seems to be another person's good, because it is related to another, for it does what benefits another, either the ruler or the fellow member of the community. Verse 9. Insofar as virtue is related to another person, it is justice, and insofar as it is a certain sort of state without qualification, it is virtue. Verse 10. Justice requires actions in accord with the other virtues, and prohibits actions in accord with the vices. The correctly established law does this correctly, and the less carefully framed one does this worse. Verse 11. In any action where too much and too little are possible, the fair amount is also possible. Since the equal and fair is intermediate, the just is some sort of intermediate condition. Verse 12. It is clear also that doing justice is intermediate between doing injustice and suffering injustice. Since doing injustice is having or taking too much, and suffering injustice is having too little. Verse 13. Justice requires four things at least. The people for whom it is just are two or more, and the equal things involved are two or more. Justice between the people is measured as intermediate between too much and too little virtue, and justice between the two things is measured as equal based on monetary value or quantity. Section 2. Justice in example. Verse 14. If one makes not only a profit on a vicious act, but an unjust profit, we can refer it to no other vice except injustice. Verse 15. 
For example, if A commits adultery for profit and makes a profit, but B commits adultery because of his appetite, because of his appetite, and spends money on it to his own loss, B seems intemperate rather than overreaching, but A seems unjust, not merely intemperate. Clearly, then, this is because A acts to make a profit. Verse 16. Special injustice is concerned with honor or wealth or safety and aims at the pleasure that results from making a profit, whereas the concern of injustice as a whole is what concerns the truly excellent and just person. In other words, the unjust person wants gain that is unfair at the expense of what is justly due to another. Verse 17. One's own possession or one's child is as though it were a part of oneself until it is old enough and or separated. So there is no unqualified injustice in relation to what is one's own. Verse 18. If one acts in knowledge but without previous deliberation, it can be an act of injustice. This is true, for instance, of actions caused by spirit and other feelings that are natural or necessary for human beings. But whenever one's decision is the cause, one is considered unjust and vicious. Verse 19. In cases of anger, we typically agree about the fact and dispute about which action was just. But in commercial transactions, the cheater, who has plotted against his victim, knows very well that what he is doing is unjust. Hence, in cases of anger, the agent thinks he is suffering injustice, while in transactions, the cheater will claim innocence. Verse 20. Some involuntary actions are to be pardoned, and some are not. For if someone's error is not only committed in ignorance, but also caused by ignorance, it is to be pardoned. But if an error committed in ignorance is caused not by ignorance, but by some feeling that is neither natural nor human, it is not to be pardoned. Verse 21. There is a way in which servants, or hands or machines, at someone else's order, kill. The servant, then, does not do injustice, but does something that is unjust. This can help explain how prison guards at tyrannical labor camps can justify to themselves all the harm they inflict on prisoners. They may say they are simply engaging in various actions, but their character and title as prison guard does not change. Those working in factory-scale animal slaughterhouses offer us perhaps an even better example, as animals are always more innocent than humans. Verse 22. It is possible for there to be a sort of justice of certain parts of a person to himself, much like the justice of masters or parents. For instance, different parts of the soul can be in conflict with each other. People look at these and it seems to them that there is injustice to oneself, because in these parts it is possible to suffer something against one's own desires. Hence it is possible for those parts to be just to each other, but not in equality. For the part of the soul with reason should be the master to the non-rational part. Section 3. Rectification of Injustice. Verse 23. Different political systems agree on the importance of distributive justice and equality, and all insist that distribution should be equal to worth. They differ on what counts as the sort of worth relevant in just distributions of powers and offices. Verse 24. Whenever equals receive unequal shares, or unequals equal shares, that is the source of quarrels and accusations. So during rectification, social equality among the people involved is essential. Verse 25. The just in transactions is a sort of equality, and the unjust a sort of inequality. These accord with numerical proportion. For here it does not matter if a decent person has taken from a base person, or a base person has taken from a decent person. 
Rather, the law looks only at differences in the harm inflicted and treats the people involved as equals. Verse 26. Hence the just in rectification concerning transactions is the intermediate between loss and profit. Verse 27. In an unjust action, one term becomes more and the other less, and this is indeed how it turns out in practice, since the one doing injustice has more of the good and the victim has less. With an evil action, the ratio is reversed, since the lesser evil, compared to the greater, counts as a good. Verse 28. Reciprocity suits neither distributive nor rectification justice, Though people take even the common primitive conception of justice, an eye for an eye, to describe rectification justice. One reason is because the voluntary or involuntary character of the action makes a great difference in many cases. Verse 29. Another reason, an eye for an eye, does not work has to do with the social and political position of the people involved. For example, a ruling official wounding someone else while exercising his office can merely receive corrective treatment in retaliation. But if an ordinary citizen wounded a ruling official, he must not only receive corrective treatment, but be wounded himself also to make the injustice rectified in reciprocity. Verse 30. Knowing how actions must be done and how distributions must be made if they are to be just, takes more work than it takes to know about healthy things. Even in the case of healthy things, knowing about honey, wine, burning, and cutting is easy, but knowing how these must be distributed to produce health and to whom and when takes all the work that it takes to be a doctor. Section 4. Justice Within Society Verse 31. No community for exchange is formed from two doctors. It is formed from a doctor and a farmer, and in general, from people who are different and unequal and who must be equalized. Hence, a community requires members who are dissimilar enough to gain from its cohesion. Verse 32. In reality, it is need, not currency, that holds everything together in a community. For if people needed nothing, or needed things to different extents, there would be either no exchange or not the same exchange. Verse 33. Proportionality of some kind must be established before exchange can take place in a community. Verse 34. Hence, at least all external goods must have a price, for in that way there will always be exchange, and community will be insured prosperity into the future. Verse 35. A human being tends to award himself too many goods and becomes a tyrant. A ruler, however, is a guardian of the just and must not award himself too many goods. If a ruler is just, he seems to profit nothing by it. Verse 36. Since the just ruler does not award himself more of what is considered without qualification good if it is not proportionate to him, he seems to labor for another's benefit. That is why we allow only reason, not a human being, to be the ultimate ruler. That is also why justice is said to be another person's good, as we remarked before. Verse 37. Being a good man is not the same as being every sort of good citizen, for justice applies mostly to the citizen as virtue applies mostly to the human being. So when speaking on justice, our focus of attention will naturally shift from the independent individual to the citizen of the state, although they may be one and the same person in reality. Verse 38. The universality of law across a diverse population allows some actions to be deficient in justice. So it is the decent person who will naturally rectify the errors of omission or tyranny that come from the universality of law. Hence, the decent is just, and also better, as a certain way of being just. Verse 39. 
It is also evident from this who the decent person is, for he is the one who decides on and does such actions, not an exact stickler for justice in the bad way, but taking less than he might even though he has the law on his side. This is the decent person, and his state is decency. It is a sort of justice, and not some state different from it. Chapter 9. Impediments to Virtue. Incontinence and Dissimilar Friendships. Section 1. On Incontinence, the Schism Between Virtue of Thought and Character. Verse 1. There are three common conditions of character to be avoided, vice, incontinence, and bestiality. The contrary to bestiality is most suitably called virtue superior to us, a heroic or divine sort of virtue. Bestiality and its contrary are most rarely found of the three. Verse 2. The incontinent person knows that his actions are base, but does them because of his feelings, whereas the continent person knows that his appetites are base, but because of reason does not follow them. Verse 3. The simply incontinent person is not incontinent about everything, but he has the same range as the intemperate person. He is incontinent by being inclined toward things in this way. The intemperate person acts on decision when he is led on since he thinks it is right to pursue the pleasant thing at hand. The incontinent person, however, thinks it is wrong to pursue this pleasant thing, yet still pursues it. Verse 4. We speak of knowing in two ways. We ascribe it both to someone who has it without using it, and to someone who is using it. Hence, it will matter whether someone has the knowledge that his action is wrong, without attending to his knowledge, or he both has it and attends to it. Verse 5. Someone's action may well conflict with his knowledge if he has both the universal and particular premises, but uses only the universal premise, for it is particulars that are achievable in action. Verse 6. Spirited reactions, sexual appetites, and some conditions of this sort clearly disturb both knowledge and the body, and even produce fits of madness in some people. Clearly then, since incontinent people are also affected by strong feelings, we should say that they hold knowledge in a way similar to the aforementioned people. Verse 7. The last premise in action is a belief about something perceptible that controls action. And this, it seems, is what the incontinent person does not have when he is being affected. Or rather, the way he has it is not knowledge of it, but as we see in people just beginning to learn something, merely saying the words. Incontinent people seem to be saying the words of their beliefs in the way that actors do. Verse 8. Incontinence and intemperance are in fact about the same pleasures and pains, but not in the same way. The intemperate person decides on them, but the incontinent person does not. That is why if someone has no appetites, or slight ones for excesses, but still pursues them and avoids moderate pains, we will take him to be more intemperate than the person who does it because he has intense appetites. Verse 9. One sort of vice is human, and this is called simple vice. Another sort is called vice with an added condition, and is said to be bestial or diseased vice, but not simple vice. For example, if someone's natural character makes him afraid of everything, even the noise of a mouse, he is a coward with a bestial sort of cowardice. Similarly then, it is also clear that one sort of incontinence is bestial, another diseased, but only the incontinence corresponding to human intemperance is simple incontinence. Verse 10. Let us also observe that incontinence about spirit is less shameful than incontinence about appetites, for spirit would seem to hear reason a bit, but to mishear it. It is like over-hasty servants who run out before they have heard all their instructions and then carry them out wrongly, or dogs who bark at any noise at all 
before looking to see if it is a friend. Verse 11. The person who is prone to be overcome by pleasures is incontinent. The one who overcomes pleasures is continent. The one overcome by pains is soft. And the one who overcomes them is resistant. The state of most people is in between, though indeed they may lean more toward the worst states. Verse 12. One person pursues excesses of pleasant things because they are excesses and because he decides on it, for themselves and not for some further result. He is intemperate and bound to have no regrets and thus is incurable, since someone without regrets is incurable. The one who is deficient is his opposite, while the intermediate one is temperate. Verse 13. The continent person is opposite to the incontinent and the resistant to the soft. For resistance consists in holding out and continence in overcoming. But holding out is different from overcoming, just as not being defeated differs from winning. Hence, continence is more choice worthy than resistance. Verse 14. The lover of amusements also seems to be intemperate but in fact he is soft. Amusement is a relaxation, since it is a release. So he is, in a sense, overwhelmed by the pain of boredom, and thus seeks amusement to an excess. Verse 15. One type of incontinence is impetuosity, while another is weakness. For the weak person deliberates, but then his feeling makes him abandon the result of his deliberation. But the impetuous person is led on by his feelings because he has not deliberated. Verse 16. Quick-tempered and volatile people are most prone to be impetuously incontinent. For in quick-tempered people, the appetite is so fast, and in volatile people so intense, that they do not wait for reason because they tend to follow sense perception. Verse 17. The impetuous type of incontinence found in volatile people is more easily cured than the weak type of incontinence found in those who deliberate but do not abide by it. Incontinence through habituation is more easily cured than the natural incontinence, for habit is easier than nature to change. Indeed, the reason why habit is also difficult to change is that it is like nature. Verse 18. Among the incontinent people, the impetuous are better than those who have reason, but do not abide by it. For the second type are overcome by a less strong feeling, and do not act without having deliberated, as the first type do. Verse 19. Evidently, then, incontinence is not a vice, though presumably it is in a way. For incontinence is against one's decision, but vice accords with decision. Incontinent people are not unjust, but are prone to do injustice. Verse 20. There are some people who tend to abide by their belief and are called stubborn, who are hard to persuade into something and not easy to persuade out of it. They have some similarity to continent people, just as the wasteful person has to the generous and the rash to the confident. But they are different on many points. For the continent person is not swayed because of feeling and appetite, but he is not inflexible about everything, since he will be easily persuaded whenever it is appropriate. But stubborn people are not swayed by reason, for they acquire a sort of strong-spirited appetite, and many of them are led on by pleasures. Verse 21. The temperate person is the sort to find nothing pleasant against reason. But the continent is the sort to find such things pleasant, but not to be led by them. So the temperate person seems to acquire a taste for virtue, while the continent person develops willpower to defend against vice. Verse 22. One person cannot be at once both prudent and incontinent, for we have shown that a prudent person must also at the same time be excellent in character and the incontinent person is not. However, a clever person may well be incontinent. Indeed, the reason people sometimes seem to be prudent, 
but incontinent is that they differ insofar as prudence requires the correct decision. Verse 23. The temperate person avoids pleasures, and the prudent person pursues what is painless, not what is pleasant. Further, pleasures impede prudent thinking, and impedes it more the more we enjoy them. No one, for instance, can think about anything during sexual intercourse. Verse 24. Neither prudence nor any state is impeded by the pleasures arising from it, but only by alien pleasures. For the pleasures arising from study and learning will make us study and learn all the more. That is why the temperate person avoids these alien pleasures, since there are other pleasures of the temperate person too. Verse 25. The claim that the temperate person avoids pleasure, that the prudent person pursues the painless life, and that young people and beasts pursue pleasure, all these are solved by the same reply. Not all pleasures are good without qualification. These qualified pleasures involve appetite, pain, and the bodily pleasures and their excesses, whose pursuit makes the intemperate person intemperate. Verse 26. It is also commonly agreed that pain is an evil and is to be avoided, for one kind of pain is bad without qualification, and another is bad in a particular way, by impeding activities. Verse 27. That is why the completely happy person needs to have goods of the body, external goods, and fortune included in his life, so that his activities will be complete and not be unnecessarily impeded. Verse 28. Because happiness needs fortune added, some believe good fortune is the same as happiness, but it is not. For when fortune is excessive, it actually impedes happiness, and then it is no longer rightly called good fortune, and perhaps seen by others as a shadow of greed or another vice concerned with wealth. Verse 29. The fact that both beasts and human beings pursue pleasure is some sign of its being in some way the best good. But since the best nature and state is not the same for all, they also do not all pursue the same pleasure. Presumably, they do pursue the same pleasure, and not the one they would say they pursue, for all things by nature have something divine in them. However, the bodily pleasures have taken over the name because all people share in them and most often aim at them. Since these are the only pleasures they know, people suppose that they are the only pleasures. Verse 30. The base person is base because he pursues the excess, not because he pursues the necessary pleasures, for all enjoy delicacies and wines and sexual relations in some way though not all in the right way. Verse 31. Bodily pleasure seems to push out pain, much like the form of relaxation enjoyed by the lover of amusements. Excesses of pain make people seek a cure in the pursuit of excessive pleasure and of bodily pleasure in general. These cures become intense, and that is why they are pursued, because they appear next to their contraries. Verse 32. Further, bodily pleasures are pursued because they are intense, often by people who are incapable of enjoying other pleasures. Certainly, these people induce some kinds of thirst in themselves. What they do is not a matter for reproach whenever the pleasures are harmless, but it is base whenever they are harmful. These people do this because they enjoy nothing else, and many people's natural constitution makes the neutral condition painful to them. Verse 33. Pleasures without pains, however, have no excess. These are pleasant by nature and not coincidentally. By coincidentally pleasant things, I mean, for instance, the process of healing. This seems to be pleasant, but it is really just a coincidence, as it is our body's health system working normally and efficiently. Things are pleasant by nature, however, when they when they produce action of a healthy nature, like study. The pleasure coming from study has no excess and always leads to more study and more virtue in our lives. Verse 34. 
The reason why no one thing is always pleasant is that our nature is not simple, but has more than one constituent, insofar as we are perishable. The action of one part is against another part in us, and when they are equally balanced, the action seems neither pleasant nor painful. For if something has a simple or basic nature, the same action will always be the most pleasant. Verse 35. There is pleasure in rest more than in change. Variation in everything is sweet, as the poet says, because of some inferiority. For just as it is the inferior human being who is prone to variation, so also the nature that needs variation is inferior, since it is not simple, decent, or well-founded. Chapter 9, Section 2 common problems in friendships. Verse 36. In all friendships of friends with dissimilar aims, proportion equalizes and preserves the friendship. In political friendship, for instance, the cobbler receives a worthy exchange for his shoes, and so do the weaver and the others. Here, money is supplied as a common measure. Everything is related to this and measured by it. In erotic friendships, however, sometimes the lover charges that he loves the beloved deeply and is not loved in return, and in fact perhaps he has nothing lovable in him. The beloved, however, often charges that previously the lover was promising him everything and now fulfills none of his promises. Verse 37. Who should fix the worth of a benefit, the giver or the one who has already received it? Surely the latter, for the giver would seem to entrust the judgment to the one who has received. Presumably the price must be not what it appears to be worth when he has got it, but the price he put on it before he got it. Verse 38. Usually we should return favors rather than do new favors for our companions, just as we should return a loan to a creditor rather than lend to a companion. Verse 39. If making a gift to B outweighs returning the money to A by being finer or more necessary, we should incline to make the gift to B instead. Verse 40. It seems that we must supply means of support to parents more than anyone. For we suppose that we owe them this, and that it is finer to supply those who are the causes of our being than to supply ourselves in this way. We should also accord honor to our parents, just as we should to the gods, but not every sort of honor, for we should not accord the same honor to a father as to a mother, nor accord to them the honor due to a wise person or a general. We should accord a father's honor to a father, and likewise a mother's to a mother. Verse 41. We should accord to every older person the honor befitting his age by standing up, giving up seats, and so on. With companions and brothers, we should speak freely and have everything in common. To kinsfolk, fellow tribesmen, fellow citizens, and all the rest, we should always try to accord what is proper and should compare what belongs to each as befits closeness of relation, virtue, or usefulness. Admittedly, this comparison is easier with people of the same kind and more difficult with people of different kinds. But such difficulty is no reason for giving up the comparison. Rather, we should define as far as we can. Verse 42. Dissolving friendships for utility or pleasure is natural when the utility or pleasure ceases to exist. But sometimes we may blame the person in a utility or pleasure relationship who pretended it to be a relationship on character. Friends are most at odds when they are not friends in the way they think they are. Verse 43. If we mistakenly believe to be loved for our character when our partner does nothing to suggest this, we ourselves are to blame. But if he uses pretense to deceive us, we are right to accuse him. Our accusations are even more justified than debasers of currency, for his actions harm a more precious thing. Verse 44. If a good friend becomes bad in character, we should dissolve the friendship, although only immediately with someone incurably vicious. 
Similarly, when one friend in time far exceeds the other in virtue, the friendship should dissolve. But the better friend should maintain kindness and memory of the dissolved friend and relationship, unless excessive vice causes the dissolution. Verse 45. He who has no regrets is eager to share his pleasures and bitter memories. He knows happiness comes from virtuous action, so he is not entitled to good or bad results, and thus has no regrets and cannot blame or reproach himself. He can share all of his experiences openly. Verse 46. Base people are at odds with themselves and do not have these features. They wish one thing and have an appetite for another, as incontinent people do. They do not choose what is good for themselves or are unable to get it, so cannot make excellent friends. Verse 47. The most base become hateful of life in general and destroy themselves. One part doesn't like to be restrained, while the other part enjoys the intended action, so these two parts go in different directions and seem to tear the person apart. Verse 48. Goodwill may be a beginning to friendship, but not an essential part as much as loving or cooperation. Goodwill can be seen as an inactive friendship. Verse 49. Friendships of utility and pleasure do not create goodwill and rely more on justice. Even so, goodwill seems to come from virtue and decency when we see something fine in another. Even as a spectator in a stadium, the seed of goodwill is sown and can eventually sprout to a complete friendship. Verse 50. Concord is also an important feature of friendship and not merely sharing a common belief. When we agree on what is advantageous, make the same decision, and act on that resolution, we are in concord, just as a city can be considered in concord. Verse 51. So concord is political friendship, as its concern is life as a whole. Genuine concord is confined to virtuous people. Decent people are by nature in concord with themselves and others, since they are practically of the same mind. Verse 52. Base people can only be slightly in concord at best. They naturally shirk labors and public services while simultaneously overreaching in demands for benefits. The result is conflict. They compel others to do justice but are unwilling to do it themselves. Verse 53. In everything praiseworthy, the excellent awards more of the fine to himself. In this way, we must be self-lovers. But in the way the many are, we ought not to be. For the many are prone by nature more towards vices like intemperance, and as they love themselves, they grow more intemperate. Verse 54. So base people and virtuous people are both self-lovers in a way, but differ in kind differing as much as a life guided by reason differs from a life guided by feelings, and as much as the desire for what is fine differs from the desire for what seems advantageous. Verse 55. Good people's lives together allows for the cultivation of virtue, bettering all those involved. Living together means we must perceive our friend's being, together with our own, and we do this when we live together and share conversation and thought. For in the case of human beings, what seems to count as living together is this sharing of conversation and thought, not sharing the same pasture, as in the case of grazing animals. Verse 56. Living together seems to be most characteristic of friendship, and clearly you cannot live with many people and distribute yourself among them. We are also likely to share one friend's pleasure and another's grief at the same time, if we have too many friends all living together. Verse 57. How many friends are needed? It seems for utility or pleasure friendships, we definitely don't want too many. We don't want too many utility friendships because then we are overburdened. We don't want too many pleasure relationships, as this will lead to intemperance or incontinence. Just as a little seasoning on food is enough, we don't need many pleasure friendships. Verse 58. 
It seems impossible to be extremely close friends to many people, just as it seems impossible to be passionately in love with many people. Those who have many friends and treat everyone as close to them seem to be friends to no one, except in the way fellow citizens are friends. These people are regarded as ingratiating. Verse 59. If one is a truly decent person, having a fellow citizen's friendship for many people, and not ingratiating, we can be satisfied with having even a few of such friends. Although it is still highly unlikely to be many people's friend for themselves and their virtue. Verse 60. It is more useful to have friends in ill fortune, but more fine to have friends in good fortune. That is why we also seek decent friends, for it is more choice-worthy to do good to them and spend our time with them. Verse 61. The presence of friends seems to be a mixture of pleasure and pain. We feel pleasure at seeing our friends when we are in ill fortune. It helps to alleviate our pain. Nonetheless, awareness of their pain at our ill fortune is painful to us, for everyone tries to avoid causing pain to their friends. Verse 62. The masculine nature tends to prevent his friend sharing his pain and does not allow others to share his mourning, since he is not prone to mourn himself either. The feminine nature enjoys having people to wail with. They love them as friends who share their distress. But in everything, we clearly must imitate the better person. Verse 63. In good fortune, we seek the presence of friends to share pleasure. But we must hesitate to call them to share our ill fortune, since we must share bad things with them as little as possible. Verse 64. We should invite our friends most of all whenever they will benefit us greatly, with little trouble to themselves. Conversely, we would eagerly offer help to a friend in misfortune. As our assistance becomes finer and more difficult for us to do, we shall also be more eager to help our friend, without needing to be called. Verse 65. Similarly, an excellent person and friend will be slow to come to receive benefits from the other, since eagerness to be benefited is not fine. Furthermore, one should avoid getting a reputation for being a killjoy, as sometimes happens, by refusing benefits. Verse 66. Whatever someone regards as his being or ultimate end for which he chooses to be alive, that is the activity he wishes to pursue in his friend's company. Chapter 10. Beyond Ethos Verse 1 Is our discourse finally finished? Of course not, because the aim of studies about action is surely not to study and know about a given thing, but rather to act on our knowledge. Hence, knowing about virtue is not enough, for we must also try to possess and exercise virtue or become good in any other way. Verse 2 Arguments are enough to inspire confidence in action among those who are born of good character, but they seem unable to turn the many toward being fine and good, for the many naturally obey fear, not shame. They avoid what is base because of the penalties, not because it is disgraceful. Verse 3. The soul of the student needs to have been prepared by habits for enjoying and hating finely, like the ground that is to nourish seed. For someone who lives in accord with his feelings would not even listen to an argument turning him away, or comprehend it if he did listen. And in that state, how could he be persuaded to change? In general, feelings seem to yield to force, not to argument. Hence, we must already in some way have a character suitable for virtue, fond of what is fine, and objecting to what is shameful in order to be impressed to action by these arguments. Verse 4. The many, especially the young, do not find it pleasant to live in a temperate and resistant way. Laws and communities must prescribe the upbringing and practices that evoke the virtues from an early age, so they will not find these things painful when they get used to them. Verse 5. 
Even so, many young people also need to continue these same good practices and become habituated to them as they become adults. Hence, we should aim to have laws for each of the major ages in life. For the many yield to compulsion more than to argument, and to sanctions more than to the fine. Verse 6. Legislators may urge people toward virtue and exhort them to aim at the fine. This assumes that one of decency and good habits will listen to them. Legislators must also impose corrective treatments and penalties on anyone who disobeys or lacks the right nature, and must completely expel an incurable. The decent person will attend to reason and aim at the fine, whereas the base person, since he desires pleasure, has to receive corrective treatment by pain, like a beast of burden. The pains imposed must be those most contrary to the pleasures he likes. Verse 7. Law has the power to compel in the way that the father or the individual does not, except for a king or someone like that. Law is reason that proceeds from a sort of prudence and understanding. Law is not burdensome in the way that an oppressive individual can be, even if that individual is correct in oppressing our impulses. Verse 8. Many cities and nations neglect these duties, and so it is best if the community attends to upbringing and attends correctly. If even the community neglects the duty of upbringing, it seems fitting for each individual to promote the virtue of his children and his friends, to be able to do it or at least to decide to do it. Verse 9. Education adapted to an individual is actually better than a common education for everyone, just as individualized medical treatment is better. For though generally a feverish patient benefits from rest and starvation, presumably some patient does not, nor does the boxing instructor impose the same way of fighting on everyone. Verse 10. Some people seem to be their own best doctors, though unable to help anyone else at all. So, a knowledge of particular cases can still be ineffective for dealing with particular cases. Nonetheless, someone who wants to be an expert in craft or study should progress to the universal and come to know the principles as far as possible, for that is what the sciences are all about. Verse 11. Someone who wishes to make people better by his attention or through education should try to acquire legislative science, if laws are a means to make us good. But how does one acquire or study legislative science? Verse 12. Legislative science seems to be a part of political science, but we should seek teachers who also practice their craft. So we should not learn from the sophists, who advertise that they teach politics, but none of them practice it in actuality. Instead, those who practice it are the political activists, and they seem to act on some sort of capacity and experience rather than mere thought. However, political science, like medicine, will be practically relevant only if it is not confined to reports of experience or textbooks, and rests on experience in the field most of all. Verse 13. This account of political science is not yet complete and must be attended to in a further work. Let us then begin again from the beginning. Epilogue. For some people, the ethos will be sufficient and complete as is. But for some others, this text and audiobook will not be fully relevant to their lives. Sometimes this can happen because of social or cultural reasons, and other times this can happen because the verses in the ethos are not specific enough to certain circumstances. In the following short essays, I provide examples on how to elaborate and extend on the ethos. This text is meant primarily to provide a systematic framework and solid moral and metaphysical ground to stand on. The completion and manifestation of ethos is mostly up to the reader. Section 1. On Modernity. 
For whatever reasons, many people today find themselves suffering from nihilism, despair, and or an excess of moral relativity, asking themselves questions like, how do I know for sure what is the good, or God, or evil, or anything else for that matter? As with most other human problems I've seen, the answer is sometimes so simple we overlook it. A cure for nihilism and moral relativity is found in just one verse of the ethos, chapter 1, verse 1. Quote, There is a highest good. All other goods are subordinate to the highest good. Unquote. The first sentence presupposes a few things. Namely, there are things that are good and bad, and one thing that is the most good. For many people today, that is not self-evidently true. However, the truth does not change just because a lot of people have forgotten it or cannot see it clearly. So let's explore this further. Can some things be good and or bad? Yes, of course. We experience this nearly every moment of our lives. For example, some foods taste good and bad. But is there one food that is the most good or has the most taste? Surely, it would be absurd to propose one food for all people to enjoy most of all. However, given one person, in one circumstance, in only one moment, we can see that there is indeed always a highest good. When I'm very thirsty, I drink water, and it quenches my thirst. But I notice if I drink too much water, it may quench my thirst, but also leave me feeling bloated. So then I have a new problem. If I drink too little water or low-quality water, my thirst isn't completely quenched or I still feel uneasy. In such a circumstance, there is some ideal amount of water, some ideal kind of water, and some ideal way to drink it. That will quench my thirst in the most ideal way. The ethos concerns the daily life of the individual most of all, so that is good enough for now. We can now clearly see, as Aristotle asserted simply, there is a highest good. As soon as we admit that, we must also admit to a hierarchy of goods, from the most good to the least good to everything in between. Now that we know this, we know that perfection is always waiting around the corner. It could be the perfect glass of water or anything else, changing with every single moment. Now we are in a world of ultimate meaning, the opposite of nihilism. A moral relativist may say, you can look for the highest good for you as much as you like, but you have no right to say what the highest good is for anyone else. That's true, but only concerning the particulars. In the universal sense, as we've just seen, there is always a highest good to strive for in each and every moment. To truly know what is good or bad and not be sucked into an infinite regress of relativity, we need to be constantly looking within ourselves. Our pleasures and pains show us how we respond to different stimuli and circumstances in our environment and relationships. If we keep in mind our pleasures and pains with respect to the major virtues, we will always know if we are on the path to excess, deficiency, or the golden mean in between. In just a short time of practicing this kind of ethos mindfulness, we can start to see more clearly what is good or bad for ourselves. Section 2. On Meta-Virtues one treasure I found hidden between the lines of this work is what I call meta-virtues. These are the preeminent virtues that apply to all other virtues. These meta-virtues are good to work on because if we have them formed well in our character, it will make learning all other virtues much easier. Some of these meta-virtues are explicitly described by Aristotle, such as prudence, in chapter 8, verse 11, and... 839. But some other virtues also work naturally well as meta-virtues, my favorite being truthfulness. If we lie to ourselves about particulars in perception, we cannot be prudent. If we lie to ourselves about our wealth, we cannot be properly generous or magnificent. If we lie to ourselves about bodily pleasures and pains, 
or feelings like fear and confidence, we cannot be fully temperate or brave. We can clearly see that truthfulness is an essential virtue and a meta-virtue that applies to all other virtues. Truthfulness may be the most important virtue for most of us in this severely degraded modern world. All around the world, in every major industrialized nation, we find a strong sense of morality is ever decreasing and materialistic sense gratification is ever increasing. In such times, truthfulness seems to be the best moral ground remaining from which we can build and live a decent life. This meta-virtue could also be called logos and will probably require further study and publication. Section 3 on socio-cultural applications of ethos, East and West. The ethos was written mainly by Westerners for Westerners. So naturally, there are some things lost in translation for Easterners. The Eastern world is much less individualistic than the West and also places more focus on social cohesion. As we see in the ethos and also in history, the truly magnanimous man often exploits others and leaves others' lives destroyed in his great and sometimes terrible wake. One modern-day example that fits well is Steve Jobs. Jobs is a great example of magnanimity. He knew he was worthy of great accomplishments, and he demanded to be seen that way. In time, we all saw that he really was the great soul who he said he was, and he accomplished many great things. However, some argue that he was too great. Jobs was notorious for being harsh on his employees, who were essential for his success. He died prematurely of cancer, leaving his children fatherless and his international corporation without proper leadership. If his diet was not so magnanimous, he could still be alive today in 2019. The Eastern man often chooses humility over greatness, and this is indeed wise and prudent for any man who desires a close and beneficial relationship with family and other citizens in the community and a sustainable society to withstand the test of time. This is exactly what history has showed us. There are only two great nations that survived and thrived for the entire span of human history, China and India. Both of these nations are Eastern, and both have always placed an importance on humility rarely found in the West. When should we be humble? The most natural time to be humble is when we are with a superior, our grandparents, our boss, a governor, etc. Should we also practice humility among equals and inferiors? In a secular society, this would appear strange at first, but in any kind of pure religious or spiritual society, humility is universally considered a good practice for everyone in most circumstances. If God is our father and we are his children, and all the other creatures on this planet are as well, we will naturally feel equal with everyone around us and often humble as well, for a child is typically humble when depending on his father for sustenance and protection. For my Eastern friends and spiritual family, I recommend the following edits be made to the ethos. The section on magnanimity in the ethos should be reduced in length and importance. I would also like to add one more virtue of character, humility. If humility is a virtue, essentially the same as the other virtues, we will naturally find three conditions, the excess, deficient, and intermediate. This virtue will fit nicely after honorosity in the ethos and is quite similar to honorosity, with the main difference being focus on social cohesion instead of personal honor. I've tried to make the voice of these verses as close as possible to Aristotle's while also keeping it easy to read and understand for most readers. I also offer this section as an example for others who wish to modify the ethos to better suit their personal or societal development while maintaining the essential aspects of the text. Section 4. Humility. Verse 1. In social matters, 
we are sometimes reproached for being too eager to act. At other times, we are shamed for not taking initiative. We also find that when our superior commands us or disciplines us, we can respond in a way that receives praise or blame. The virtue most concerning these seems to be humility. Verse 2. In work, it seems prudent to be humble towards our co-workers with more experience than us, and of course to our supervisors as well. Even for those co-workers who are ranked lower than us, it is still better to be humble and modest with them, unless it is part of our duty to discipline them or lead them directly. Verse 3. When among fellow citizens, we may naturally see them as equals. However, among strangers, most cultures prefer to begin conversations in a state of humility or politeness among both parties. In time, as we grow more accustomed to each other, the virtues of friendliness and wit will be more relevant than humility in these relationships. Verse 4. In family matters, it is always wise to be humble towards our elders. Are there some times when we should stand up to our parents? It seems there are a few outlying circumstances. If our parents or elders suffer from dementia or another kind of severe mental illness or perhaps decades of subversive propaganda, we may be required to act like a leader with them for their own protection. Verse 5. The excess condition for humility looks like timidity, but it is really social anxiety. When we are too humble, we lose sight of important opportunities for us. We are sometimes rightfully challenged by our teachers and mentors, and in these moments, they want us to face these challenges and not shy away in the name of social conformity. Verse 6. The deficient condition for humility is a kind of unawareness in social matters, commonly referred to as being clueless. If we are not humble enough, we are sometimes seen as rash or ignorant or rude, depending on the circumstance. For example, when our grandmother asks us for a glass of water and we refuse because we are in the middle of something mundane, she should rightfully feel offended and scold us for being deficient in humility. Verse 7. When forced to err towards the excess or deficient condition, the humble person will most always rather be excessively humble than not humble enough. The deficiency in humility also corresponds to a lack of comprehension or prudence, which the virtuous person will always try to correct. Verse 8. We can see that as we grow older, we naturally become better at humility. Young people are found more often in the two extreme conditions. Indeed, even the least humble teenage boy will probably grow into at least an adequately humble elderly man. Verse 9. As with all the virtues, we must look to our own natural tendencies to find out where we are more likely to falter and then aim more towards the contrary condition to get closer towards the mean. Section 5. Male and Female The ethos was written by men, primarily for men. As it is, the ethos can be used beneficially by women, but for many women, there are some sections I would add to the ethos to make it more practical for most women. The virtues that seem to be most masculine seem obvious, bravery and magnanimity, to name a couple. But which virtues are feminine is not so obvious, partly because feminine nature by herself is curvaceous and boundary-defying. She is always difficult to, quote, pin down with straight lines or analyze scientifically. We might assume that the most feminine virtues would simply be the mirror opposite to the most masculine virtues. Let's give it a try. The virtue that may be opposite to bravery, while still being considered a virtue, could be shyness. If a woman is too assertive, she is often reproached. If she is too shy and does not have a husband or brother to protect her, this is not good either. 
This intermediate condition is a kind of shyness that is proper to a woman and usually corresponds with her being considered beautiful or angelic also. The virtue that may be the opposite of magnanimity could be called modesty. Instead of being direct with others about being worthy of great things, a truly great woman will hide her greatness to others and even insist that her greatness is found instead in her husband and children. Such a woman is actually just as magnanimous as a man may be, but she keeps this virtue inside her heart, whereas a magnanimous man will prefer a large external display of his prowess. It seems that when a woman is truly virtuous, with modesty as the adornment of all her other virtues, she always receives much praise and is greatly valued in society by all. These two female virtues, shyness and modesty, I will not write any new verses for, as I am not a woman. For the best effect, I think verses like these ones that are dedicated to only women should be written in a very different voice than Aristotle or Alexander. Perhaps poetry will be better than prose here. Not only can we see some virtues have masculine or feminine aspects, we can also see that some virtues are more or less important to the two sexes. For example, temperance seems to be much more important for women than men. An intemperate woman receives very harsh blame from nearly everyone in society, whereas a truly temperate woman is praised, protected, valued, and glorified as chaste, pure, and innocent. Section 6. The Categorical Imperative there is only one other ethical concept that I've studied which is worth mentioning, what Immanuel Kant calls the categorical imperative. The CI seems to be just as valid and practical for those on the moral journey to complete happiness as anything else in the ethos. Furthermore, Kant derives the CI from a priori pure reason as much as possible. Aristotle derives many of his concepts from summarizing and categorizing the ideas of other philosophers, and his approach is also closer to psychology than philosophy. I was thinking of adding a few verses to the ethos to show how the categorical imperative can work in parallel with the ethos, but I later saw that the CI is already built into the ethos implicitly. First, Let's give a simple definition for the CI. Quote, act only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. Unquote. Throughout the ethos, Aristotle is often describing his idea of the perfect man. This perfect man is always looking to do the most fine and excellent actions meaning every action or virtue of the perfect man described in the ethos is itself acting according to the CI, as this man always desires his excellence to be known and distributed as much as possible as universal law. For example, in ethos 4.2, quote, the brave person will stand firm against what frightens in the right way as reason prescribes for the sake of the fine since this is the end aimed at by virtue." Unquote. The end that is aimed at by virtue is fine action in the right way as reason prescribes. It should be obvious that the most fine action is that action that can be used as a universal law to benefit all people. There are countless other examples in the ethos of the most excellent conditions we can imagine. The examples of the most excellent person described by Aristotle is a demonstration that Aristotle himself is acting out the CI by writing this work on ethics. These verses that use language such as, for the sake of the fine, are meant to inspire us so that we can never step off this path towards excellence. He wants us to stand tall and unafraid knowing that our actions and character can be followed by everyone else in the right ways and the right times and places as reason prescribes as a kind of universal law.